Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Today I'd like to continue our discussion on full state feedback controllers. We saw in our last video that full state feedback controllers were an incredibly powerful tool. In fact, some people consider them to be the gold standard of control systems because if the system is controllable, we saw that you can move the closed loop eigenvalues of that system to any arbitrary location using a simple set of gains. Now, while this is mathematically feasible, as engineers, we should probably step back and ask, what's the price we pay for this amazing ability? As Voltaire and perhaps more recently Spider-Man's Uncle Ben Parker once said, with great power comes great responsibility. Therefore, today I'd like to look to see if there are any practical implementation issues that might arise when you try to use a full state feedback controller on a real system. So, if that sounds like fun, why don't we jump over to the whiteboard and get started. Okay, so to refresh your memory, right, the idea with full state feedback control, and in fact, the, this is going to get um, tedious writing that, so let's just abbreviate this as FSFB, full state feedback control here, right? So the idea again here was that you had some plant model here, right, which was typically modeled as a linear state space model, x dot is equal to ax plus bu, right? And y in this case is actually equal to the entire um, state vector here. So in this case, your C matrix with an identity and your D matrix was zero. So in this picture, what goes on here is again, you have a control vector of U coming in and now you have an output, which is the entire state here. And now what we were gonna do here is that we maybe didn't like where the open loop eigenvalues of this plant were. So we were gonna change this by feeding back the state vector and running it through a controller here. And in this case, we are going to use a full state feedback controller here. And what that looked like here was just a gain of negative K here, right? Now, within this context, we said that by choosing K intelligently, you can change the eigenvalues of this entire system to any arbitrary location, provided that this plant is controllable, okay? So, you know me, I always like to look at concrete examples because I th think that helps um, with the analysis here. So let's look at a plant model here of a DC or direct current motor. Okay, so um, again, uh, another plug for one of our other videos in, our, uh, in, in another discussion, we have a derivation and explanation of where the ordinary differential equations and how to model a DC motor um, manifests itself and furthermore we also talk about how to generate this linear state space model for this DC motor here so um, again I, I encourage you to watch this video here if you're interested in seeing that if not though you can think of this as just a linear plant here that we're going to be using it just happens to represent a DC motor here so the system in our case like I said here was a DC motor and the two inputs to this system here were a armature voltage, let's call it VA of T here, and also there was a disturbance torque to this. So that would represent somebody physically moving the wheel or the flywheel of the motor or some other kind of uh, torque to, to the system, right? And then those were the inputs here and the outputs, this system actually had three outputs here. So there was the position of the motor was something we we're interested in, the velocity of the motor, let's call it omega of t, and finally the current going through the motor here. So if we go ahead and maybe visualize this here as a, as a dmux here, we could say this is the entire control vector u of t here. And then finally we could mux up these three inputs, or sorry, these three outputs to get the entire output of the system, which in this case was the entire state. Okay, so here's the physical inputs and outputs of the system and then the state space representation governing this input output relationship. Again, watch that video. I'm just going to go ahead and write it down here is we basically wrote this down as a linear uh, system of x dot is equal to ax plus bu. Right. And in this case, your A matrix looked like a. Uh, 0, 1, 0, 0, minus C over JM, so damping over moment of inertia, and then our mach mechanical machine constant over the moment of inertia, and then this last row was 0, minus KV, our electrical machine constant over the inductance of the motor, minus the quantity RM plus R, so that's the total resistance of this motor, 
over the inductance here. So that was our three by three A matrix here and our B matrix. Maybe we will write it, uh, let me write it down here a little bit lower. Actually, it might be easier. And our B matrix here was a three by two, right? Because there's two inputs here. So the first column here, which dealt with the armature voltage was just zero, zero, one over G LA. And the other input here was zero minus one over JM zero. Great. Okay, so here was our states here, and um, numerically here, if you were to go plug in actual values for our particular motor here, um, let's just pick some numerical values that we can use for the purpose of this discussion. So some realistic values would look something like uh, 0, 1, 0, 0, minus 0 0.29, 71.93, 0, minus 63.24, and then minus... 1020.35 that was our a matrix and then a numerical value for our b matrix here was is going to be uh where was it here um uh, yeah here zero zero 641.81 and then zero and then actually um i forgot to write down this value but we actually don't care about this value here We'll see here in a second why, because really what we're interested in doing is we only want to use the first input for control here. So we're going to ignore this second um, external disturbance torque. We're only going to try to control like the position or the velocity or the current of the motor using the voltage that we're going to send to it. So really, we don't care about this column of the B matrix here. So really it doesn't really matter what numerical value is because we're going to neglect it and only pick this column here for the B matrix, right? Okay, so again, maybe what also it would be helpful is we should write down what is the state and what is the control vector here in this case. So maybe let's do that. Um, I didn't use the board very well here, but I think we can, maybe let's just write it, yeah, maybe right over here, okay? Just so we have it in our memory. So let me let me erase some of this. Okay, so our state vector in this case was going to be the position of the motor, the velocity of the motor, and the current through the motor here. And then our control vector here was going to be the uh, armature voltage and the disturbance load. But like we said, we're not interested in the disturbance torque. We are only going to be using the armature voltage to control the system here. So the picture that goes along with this now is in the context of having our full state feedback system here, right? We are going to have our plant model. All right, with two inputs here, we said was our armature voltage and then our disturbance torque here. And all we're going to do here is we're going to basically, uh, I don't know, just put in a constant zero going into to the disturbance torque. We're going we're to ignore it here, right? Then we had the entire state coming out, and we are now going to wrap this back and run it through a negative K. And that's how we're going to control our our. Uh, armature voltage going to this plant here, right? To the one input we're going to use for control, right? So again, under this control law, we see that, all right, that the armature voltage is going to be minus K times the state vector, right? So this was going to be our control law here. This is our full state feedback control law where we are only using the first input here um, for control here. So I want to make uh, make that clear here because although we're just using a single input, one nice thing about full state feedback control here is it really nicely and gracefully handles multiple inputs here. So if you wanted to use both the voltage and the disturbance torque to try to control the state or to regulate it to zero, you could just go through all of this discussion here and it would be uh, uh, it, it would directly follow here. And, and we're not making any um, specializations that are going to cripple us here in the future. Um, okay, so with that, what we should maybe do here is let's go ahead and now that we have a numerical value for our A matrix, it might be uh, handy to go ahead and just look at where are the open loop eigenvalues of this system here? Where do the plant, ha where does it have eigenvalues uh, naturally without any control? So let's do that right now. Okay, let me erase the board here. So to get the open loop eigenvalues of this system, I think it's pretty simple. You guys all know how to do that here. Open loop 
eigenvalues. So we can just run over to MATLAB and we will basically ask it to say eig of A, right? And this is going to return basically our eigenvalues. I think it actually gives you the eigenvalues. Uh, I, I can't ever remember which order. One of these is of eigenvalues, one of them is the eigenvectors. It, it doesn't really matter, right? You can go here and you can calculate the eigenvalues in MATLAB. You could do it by hand here. Um, but what you would end up with here is we would end up with eigenvalues of lambda 1 here being at 0. You'd have a lambda 2 here at minus 4.77 and then a lambda 3 here of minus 1015.9 here. So again, these are the open loop eigenvalues. Okay, so uh, what we can do here is let's just sketch these on the real imaginary axis here. So let me just go ahead and draw. Here's our real, here's our imaginary axis, and this is not, not going to be to scale here. Maybe we should make, make, make a note here, not to scale, right? Because you can kind of see there are some here that are, you know, there's an eigenvalue right here, and then there's something way over here at um, 1015. So I'll tell you what, actually, to help visualize that, I've got these little uh, blue X's here that we can put here. So here's one. Here is an uh, eigenvalue here at zero, right? Then we have another one here at minus uh, 4.77, right? So let me put another blue X here. That's another open loop eigenvalue. And then finally, we have one way over here at minus 1015. Uh, what was it? Point, point nine, right? Oops, sorry. Then we get rid of this black X. I forgot we're using our little blue magnets here to represent all of these here, right? Okay, so we've got our open loop eigenvalues here. Uh, we can now start thinking about designing a controller K to move these eigenvalues to some location that we desire here. So the first thing we got to do here, right, is we need to go ahead and make our controllability matrix to ensure that this is uh, controllable and that our full state feedback controller has a chance of working the way we want it to, right? So let's just quickly check controllability. Right? So we're going to make our controllability matrix PC, which is going to be B, A, B, A squared B. Right? And again, we're going to make a note here that this B here is only the first column of the original B matrix. Right? Because that's all we're using is just the first input here. Right? So we can run over here to MATLAB and we could go and basically give it, uh, you, we, could, we could build this matrix ourselves if we want, or like we talked about last time, there's this function called CTRB for the controllability matrix. You just give it the A matrix, then you give it the B matrix. And again, since we only want the first column, maybe what we should denote here is maybe we should do something like all rows column one here, right? And this would give us the controllability matrix PC here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to check the rank of this thing, right? We're going to check the rank of PC and we're going to make sure that this is equal to the number of states, which is three in this case, right? And again, um, and to save ourselves going back and forth and breaking our flow here, I'll just, I'll make the claim that this actually is true. If you run this in MATLAB, um, yeah, you'll, you, th this will come out to be a logical truth. So it's great. This system is controllable. So we can say that the system or actually slash plant maybe is, is more uh, accurate. Plant is controllable with only U1, right? Which is the armature voltage here, right? Okay, great. So it is ready to rock here. So this tells us that we can move our poles absolutely anywhere we want here, okay? So let's go ahead and, and pick something here, okay? So the first issue here, this is where we're going to start running into some of these practical implementation issues that we were talking about here, right? So the first issue that I want to look at here is let's just call it maybe under this big heading of how, let's call it control saturation problems here, right? Okay, so to set the stage for this here, um, again, we've got our open loop eigenvalues. Let's just go ahead and choose some open, uh, choose closed loop locations, right? So choose closed loop eigenvalues values slash poles 
Right, and maybe for the remainder of this discussion here, I, I think everyone realizes, right, that eigenvalues are not exactly the same thing as poles, right? You might have pole zero cancellation or something like that. But um, in general, right, the eigenvalues are a larger set than the poles of a given transfer function. But to keep our discussion simple, let's interchangeably use the word pole and eigenvalue. They really mean the same thing um, for this case. So let's try to move them to some arbitrary location. So I don't know. Let's pick something like, um, I don't know, uh, how about how about a lambda uh, one closed loop? What I'd like here is, uh, I don't know, how about minus 100? How about lambda two closed loop of minus 200? Or no, sorry, minus 110 is what I've got here on, in my example here. And a lambda three closed loop of minus 120 here, right? So again, these are my desired closed loop poles, right? So to visualize that over here, we can, we can go ahead and let's grab a couple of these other dots here. All right, so I've got some green dots to represent our desired closed loop poles. So we see that normally here, you know, our open loop poles are sitting here at the blue locations, right? But what I want is I want them at this minus 100, minus 110, minus 120. So really what I'm talking about is, you know, taking one of these and moving them here, taking this other one, maybe moving it here, and then taking this one and moving it all the way over here, right? So maybe let's put them here on the line, right? Something like that, okay? So I've got this thing here at minus 100. Well, actually, tell you what, let's do this in a different color so we can keep them straight. Maybe we'll do them in green here, right? So here's minus 100, minus 110, minus 120, right? Okay. So um, since the system is controllable, we show that mathematically there's there, this is totally feasible. In fact, the way I'm going to calculate my K matrix to get this done here, right, is I'm just going to go over to MATLAB and we're just going to say, okay, MATLAB, do pole placement like we talked about last time. So I'm just going to say place, give it the A matrix, give it the B matrix, and again, give it the uh, all rows column one here, right, because I only want the first um, uh, control here, right? Oh, sorry. Yep. Place. And then give it all of the desired locations here of your poles here, right? So I want it at minus 100, minus 110, minus 120, right? And just go ahead and this will basically return for you the, the, uh, full state feedback matrix K that you need in order to make this thing happen. So if you do that in, uh, in MATLAB, again, we'll, we'll go over to MATLAB in a second just to see what happens here. Um, actually, you know what? Maybe now is an excellent time just to, to plug this in, and then maybe we will go ahead and simulate this here. So what we'll do is let's run over to MATLAB. Let's go ahead and do this calculation, figure out what our K matrix is, and then let's build a Simulink model here to run it and check to see did the eigenvalues actually go where they where where they were supposed to? And we'll see if anything else popped up while we were trying to do this. Okay, all right. So let's uh, let's pause the filming here and we'll head over to MATLAB. All right. So here we are in MATLAB, and I've already actually typed up this script just to avoid uh, me and my fat fingers punching it in and making tons of mistakes and forcing you to watch all that. I thought I would enter it in ahead of time. As you can see, it's pretty darn standard, right? We got our normal clear CLC close all. And then the first thing I'm going to do here is just define that state space representation of the DC motor here. So here are just all of these constants here. Again, if you don't care about the actual physical meaning of the plant, you can just remember that it is a three state system here with two control inputs here. We can see that the B matrix is two columns here. So why don't we just run this first here and you can see that on line 41, what I'm gonna do here is just take a look at the open loop uh, poles or the eigenvalues of the A matrix, right? So let's just go ahead and run this first chunk here up to calculating the open loop poles. And as you can see right here, like we said earlier, you've got those poles here at zero, minus 4.7 and minus 1015.9 here, okay? All right, so coming back to the MATLAB script, we see that the next thing we want to do, like we chatted about earlier, is just check to make sure that the system is controllable using only the first control input. So I only pass in the first column of the B matrix here. Then I'm going to check the rank here. So let's just go ahead and uh, maybe just F10 that to step, and then we'll step. And yep, look at that. The rank of this system is three, so the system's fully controllable. So I can now move the poles to any location that I want. So I'm just going to go ahead and list out the locations that I care about. So I want to move the closed loop eigenvalues to minus 110, 
Oh, sorry, minus 100, minus 110, minus 120. Then I should be able to call place. Again, I'm going to pass it A and then the first column of the B matrix here. And then my list of desired poll locations here. So go ahead and step, step. And here's the uh, full state feedback matrix that's going to make this happen for me. It's, uh, yeah, K of 28.6, 0 0.68, and minus 1.08-ish, uh, something like that. Great. So now that I've got this this um, controller computed here, why don't we go ahead and simulate the system to make sure that that works. So what I'm doing right here is I'm just setting up some simulation parameters like how long I want to simulate for and then I'm going to use some non-zero initial condition and I want to make sure that the full state feedback controller will regulate this system back to the origin here. So the initial deflection of the wheel here in terms of angular position, so it's it's cocked over at 72 degrees, it has 2 pi radians per second, and it has minus 1 amps flowing through it at time 0. So here's my initial condition, and then I'm just going to simulate a Simulink model here called Practical Full State Feedback Model. Let's just go ahead and open this so we can get a look at what that uh, looks like. And again, just so you don't have to watch me cobbling blocks together, I've built this already ahead of time. Again, here's my plant model. As you can kind of see, nothing special here. You know, you've got your A, B, C, D, and my initial conditions here. The only thing to note here is maybe I'm passing in the full B matrix. So again, this system has two inputs. But as you can see here, we're just putting the external torque load or that second input to zero because all I want to do here is control the system using just the armature voltage here or the first input, right? So that's what my full state feedback gain or my controller is doing here. The only thing to maybe call to your attention here that might be a little bit hidden here is, as you know here, the control law here is VA should be equal to minus K times X. But this is a matrix multiplication or a matrix gain here. So what I actually had to do here is in this matrix here, um, or in this gain block here, is I actually had to come here to multiplication. Normally, it's set to element-wise. By default, most Simulink uh, versions are going to have it element-wise multiplication when you drop this in. That is not what you want to do in this case, right? We don't want element-wise multiplication, so I need to change this to matrix multiply. And furthermore, I need to matrix multiply K with the vector being uh, multiplied on the right. You can see you can do it opposite here, right? You could actually have the vector multiplied on the left here. So this is the appropriate operation that I want. So I need to make sure that I select it, hit apply, and OK. Great. And then the only other things to maybe call to your attention here is then let's send the state of the system back to the MATLAB uh, workspace using a two workspace block. I've got this variable called SimX, and I just changed the save format to structure with time. I like this better than time series. It's just something I'm more familiar with here. So let's save both the state and we will save the control signal. Um, and see what we end up with here. So this is what the Simulink model looks like. So I think we can go ahead and close that. And now let's just go ahead and step through this a little bit more here. So I will set up my parameters here. And now on line 60, let's just go ahead and run the simulation. And wha-bam, it's, it's done. Um, and now what I'm going to do is let's just extract the time, the three states, and the control signal and see what we end up with here. So I've just got a bunch of plotting right here. So maybe let's just F5 here. And uh, what I'll do is I'll plot the three states um, and we'll see how this controller performed in this scenario. So let me hit F5 to just jump down there. And here's the plot that we get. And look at this, this is beautiful, right? If you look at this upon uh, 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 cursory inspection, you see, yeah, we've got non-zero initial conditions here. But look at this. Whoa, bam The controller slammed this system back to the origin in less than a tenth of a second here, right? Look at this. The thing went from 72 degrees and just snapped back here to the origin in, you know, a tenth of a second. So performance is awesome. And I would say, yes, the system definitely is behaving like it has closed loop pulls at minus 100, minus 110, and minus 120, right? It's snappy. There's no oscillation. And this, you know, if you showed this to your boss, I think they would be really, really happy here, right? Now, um, 
you know, I had a professor who his favorite saying was, there's no free lunch, right? We should ask ourselves, what's the price we paid to get this phenomenal performance, right? And the thing that we can do to answer that question is we should look at the other half of the story, right? Just looking at the trajectory of the states is not enough. We really should look at the trajectory of the control signal. What did the controller do to the system in order to get this, this result? So coming back to MATLAB, that's what this second plot I'm going to make here. If you notice here, now I'm just going to plot the control signal and we'll see what it looks like. So again, let me hit F5 here and I'll pull this over and here's what happened. So we should stop and think about what does this plot mean here, right? This is the control signal. It's the voltage that we are applying to the motor here in units of volts. So you can see that what happened was, yeah, we got awesome performance, but the controller was asking for and applying something like negative 90 volts to the motor here, right? Which in many real life scenarios with these small little motors, maybe this is infeasible. Maybe your 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 bench top power supply can only supply you know plus or minus 20 volts so you see in this case mathematically we were able to get that kind of performance but it requires an enormous control signal to do that here so in a lot of real world scenarios you might saturate your controller and their controller is or, or sorry your actuator is just not going to have the control authority to enforce this type of uh, drastic change to get you that awesome performance we saw earlier so we should maybe go back to the whiteboard and think about, is there a way we can uh, ameliorate this situation? Okay, so we saw that what ended up happening is we had this control saturation issue. So maybe what we should do is let's start a little table here of maybe um, my uh, desired poles, like so P desired, all right? And let's talk about what were the resulting K was and what was the result. Okay, so let's make a little table here to start. And we saw here that if we used desired poles of what was it, minus 100, minus 110, and then minus 120, right? We ended up with a gain K here of, it was about something like 28, maybe I should have made this a little bit bigger here. Let's make this a little bigger so we have some space. Okay, something like 28, uh, 0 0.7, and minus 1.1. That was our, our gain K here. And we saw that what this ended up being here was this was a little bit uh, aggressive, right? Which led to control saturation. Right. And again, I think you can you can you can sort of see where this came from. The reason this thing was so aggressive here is because effectively what we were asking here is we wanted to drastically change the plant here with our closed loop controller here. Right. If you think about this, right, the blue X's, right, we talked about the blue X's earlier. Those were our open loop eigenvalues or our open loop poles. That's sort of how the system wants to behave in its natural state here. And what we ended up doing here is we said, no, I, I really don't like the way you behave, or I, I don't like how you naturally are. I, I don't like you as a person here, right? I want to change you here. So this is like drastically trying to change the system to instead of behave like the blue X's, I want you to behave and be a better version of yourself. I want you to be these these green X's, right, at these different locations. And that was a drastic change. That's like, that's like you know, if I went up to my dog and I said, you know what, I don't want you. I want you. I want you to stop eating off of the table. Um, I want you to stop sleeping on the furniture. And I wish you would really stop stealing all of the kids' toys here, right? But that's what he likes to do. That's his natural state. If I wanted to him to change all of that behavior simultaneously. It would take a lot of control authority here, right? I would have to to beg, bar, you know, bribe, cajole, you know, yell at him. I, I would have to exert a ton of control authority in order to change his behavior, right, or to change how he uh, how he behaves, right? So, following that line of reasoning, maybe one approach here is let's not ask the plant to change so drastically here, right? Maybe we'll say. Yeah, it's all right if you still eat off the table. Um, just don't do it so often, right? And you can still sleep on the nice living room furniture, but uh, don't do it when you're wet here, right? So what I'm, what we're basically getting at is another approach here would be to maybe don't make such a drastic change. So let's take this and move it a little bit back closer to the original 
location, right? And let's do that for all of these poles here. So these ones as well. Let's move them a little bit, something like that, okay? So what I'm uh, suggesting is, let's go with approach number two here. So the second way here is to basically choose slightly less aggressive changes here. So in this example, I don't know, let's choose something else. Maybe I'll do it in a different color here so we can keep them apart here. So this approach here is maybe let's make this here at, uh, I don't know, how about minus five, minus 30, and minus 400 here. Right? So this is a, a, a less aggressive change. I'm not asking the plant, right, the blue X's to move that far uh, from where they were originally, right? So this is like asking for a small change. So the, the process is virtually identical, right? Only thing that changes here is that I just need to change these, right? So instead of making this drastic change, let's make it a little bit less violent here. So like minus five, minus 30, and then minus 400, right? And then I just run this exact same thing um, again, right? I run the exact code again, but just with different closed loop desired poles, right? So minus five, minus 30, and minus 400, okay? And if you run that again here, what we end up with is, uh, well, you know what? Tell you what, why don't we run over to Malab and see what ends up happening and what the resultant behavior of the, the controller is. All right, we're back to that same MATLAB script. So we saw earlier that, uh, like we said earlier, this choice of selection of desired closed loop poles, this led to an aggressive controller, right? So what I want to do now is let's actually comment this out and choose slightly less aggressive locations here, right? So I, what did we suggest here? I think it was minus five, um, minus uh, 30 and minus 400 here, right? So this is hopefully a less aggressive controller, right? And now what we can do is we can rerun this entire script here with, uh, and all it's gonna do is just give us new uh, a new full state feedback controller. And then uh, we can simulate it for the exact same initial conditions and see what happens here. So tell you what, let's, let's clear all the breakpoints here from the script. Um, oh, sorry. Let me just take them off here. Uh, let me see, take off all those breakpoints. Great, okay, I think we got the breakpoints out of here. And let's just go ahead and run this thing again. And okay, so here's our new uh, controller K here. You'll notice here that the magnitude of the numbers are a little bit small, or are actually quite a bit smaller than we had before. So this should be a, a less aggressive controller. So let's take a look at the result here. So here's the result of the state trajectory and you see, Yes, it's it's definitely less aggressive. Instead of taking 0.1 seconds to come back to the origin here, you can see it it's almost an order of magnitude more. So it almost takes like a full second to come back to the origin, but it still does it in a nice fashion, right? There are, there's no overshoot. Everything comes back smoothly here. And now if we look at the control signal, this is where we're going to make some wins here, right? So if I now look at the control signal here, Ah, this is much nicer here, right? Instead of 90 volts here uh, of control authority to get that behavior, we're now only here at, you know, less than seven, ne uh, less than a magnitude of seven volts, which I'm pretty sure you're not gonna saturate your controller at this, uh, at this stage. So you can see here that this is one way that we can go about uh, uh, dealing with this control saturation issue here, right? However, even though we solved the control saturation issue, there's other, uh, practical implementation problems that we might want to think about. So let's go back to the whiteboard and examine what those are and how we can fix them. Okay, so before we actually we, talk, we, we leave the control saturation issue, maybe what we should do is let's finish up uh, our table right here. So we saw that we just had a different set of, um, of desired locations here, right? So at minus five, minus 30, and minus 400, right? What we ended up here was with a K that was something like on the order of 1.3, 0 0.2, and minus 0 0.9 here, right? And we saw that just looking at the numbers, you can see that this is a less aggressive controller, right? And this basically solved the, the issue of control saturation. So I think we can say there was no control saturation here, right? Okay. So that's great, let's leave our table here and I wanna now investigate one of the other issues here that we might uh, end up with when we're trying to implement a full state feedback controller. And in fact, this is one of probably the major issues or uh, drawbacks that make 
a full state feedback controller impractical in a lot of real world scenarios here. So the problem here is, is basically the inability to measure the full state. All right. So in other words, let's erase some of this. We can get a little bit of space here. The problem here is um, the control law, right? If you remember, is U is minus K times X, right? So in order to implement, this requires here that you measure all of X. So you need to buy a sensor to measure every single control or every single state in your system here. This can get complicated if, if your system has uh, you know, a reasonable number of controls. So for example, if you consider just a, you know, a rigid body, um, six degree of freedom model for just, you know, it could be an aircraft or a brick or just some rigid body translating in space here. Let's use an aircraft example. I think that's easiest to deal with here, right? The state vector, you can show that this thing is, um, you need to know the position here in space. So like a position north, a position east, a position down. You need to know the velocity in space. So like a, a U, V, W, these are, these are velocities in the body frame. You also need to know the angles here since this thing can, can translate as well as rotate. So I need to know three angular positions like, like um, phi, theta, and psi, maybe three Euler angles. And then I need to know their rate of change or some, uh, some idea of how this body's rotational velocity is, is evolving. So maybe let's call this P, Q, and R here. So this might be a state vector here for just, just a very, pretty much the simplest model of an aircraft that you can make. It's just a rigid brick flying through the air. And already this now has 12 states here, right? So if you wanted to implement a full state feedback controller on your aircraft, you need to measure all of these things here, right? So I need like GPS, you know, to get the position. I need um, airspeed sensors and uh, five hole probes and angle of attack vanes and something like that to measure the velocity here, right? I need, um, uh, you know, some kind of inertial measurement unit here to measure all of the Euler angles. I need rate gyros to get all these. So you can see here that quickly, if your system is somewhat complicated, uh, this can get expensive here, right? Because you need to implement or you need to purchase and directly measure accurately every single state in your system in order to implement this. So this is one of the major issues that, that we end up with. And we see we actually run into this with our simple DC motor system. So let's, let's consider our DC motor. So maybe let's change this. Instead of the aircraft example, let's just look at an example of our DC motor. Right? So our DC motor was just three states here, right? It was just the position of the motor, right? The velocity of the motor and the current running through the motor here, <clears throat> right? So the control law in this case here is if you write this thing out, right? U of T, which is effectively the armature voltage, right? This is going to be minus K, right? So there's like a K1, K2, K3 times X, right? Which is theta, omega and, and current here, right? So again, writing this thing out, you get what? You get minus K1 theta minus K2 omega minus K3 times I, right? This is how the armature voltage is, is computed, right? So this is my control law here, right? Well, in our situation here, what can we directly measure, right? We have an, an encoder that will measure the position here, right? Let's assume that this system, you know, in real life, the only thing we have in the lab here is we can measure theta here, right? So we can directly measure, right? But we don't have a, a, a speedometer on this in order to calculate the, the velocity here, right? Sure, you can probably make some approximations, like you could try to, try to take a numerical derivative of the position here, but I think if you remember in one of our previous discussions here on practical PID controllers, we saw that there are some real issues when you try to take a numerical derivative in real life here. So you can't get omega. Sure, you can maybe do things like uh, like pseudo derivatives or, or other techniques here, but long story short, you can't directly measure this. So theoretically, you cannot actually find this. So you can't implement this. So let's just mark this as a cannot measure, right? And then the current, again, there, there's no way we're going to directly measure the current here. So this is another cannot measure, all right? Um,
Maybe this is actually a good spot to maybe put another shameless plug in for one of our other videos here. This sets the stage here for this, this uh, a concept of called state estimation here, where you will eventually, you know, based on some of the states that you might be able to measure, can you somehow estimate some of these other states here, right? But let's forget about that for this discussion here. Right now, I just want to talk about pure fuse full state feedback controllers here. So in our situation, we can't actually measure these two things here, right? So what we could maybe try to do here is, um, you know, the best that we could implement here, the best that we could hope to do here is, let me see, maybe we'll, let's, let's erase some of this. I don't think we need this any longer. Is since we are not able to measure the, the, the full state of the system, we could try an approximate control law, right? So we could, we could um, design a full state feedback controller right um but implement something simpler we could implement like u right which uh, sorry u which is just va right the armature voltage it's just let's just try minus k1 times theta right because i can't measure omega and i so i, I have no freaking clue what they are so let's let's just maybe pretend like k2 and k3 are equal to zero here right so let's try that so maybe coming down here in our in our table here let's try this exact same thing here let's go ahead and do uh, a minus 5 minus 30 minus 400 here right and now what i'm going to do here is let's just put you know 1.3 here and and assume that these other two are zero here and cross our fingers and hope that that works here right because this is the best we can do we can't measure these other two states so let's just assume that their gains are zero so tell you what let's run over to matlab and uh just simulate this and see what ends up happening here all right so uh, we're back here so maybe what we should do here is uh in order to simulate the fact where we only use the first gain here maybe what we would should do here is let's copy this entire uh, block diagram here and well, let's make a second copy right below it here and maybe what we will do here is let's call this like instead of VA1 let's call it VA like tilde or something like that for for a different version of VA same thing for the state here let's call this X tilde here and now instead of a full gain matrix here what we should do here is let's delete this here and maybe pull out a demux and what I'm gonna do is break this up into the three constituent states here of x1 x2 and x3 here and maybe what we'll do here is let's just terminate x2 and 3 because we don't know what those are here right and instead now what we should do is let me see if I can pull this up and get a little bit more room let me move all this down uh, let's see like something like this here we go okay now let's go ahead and get a gain uh, come on get a gain and now this is just going to be minus k sub 1 here right so this is just the first value here and since it's just a single value element wise multiplication is perfectly fine here right so if I connect this up does everyone see what I'm doing here so in this situation my control signal now it's just the first element of my full state feedback controller multiplied by the only value of the state that I'm actually able to directly measure here right so I'm gonna now run these two systems in parallel here right so the one on top is the full full state feedback controller as we designed it to be here right so this is what would be awesome to have if we had the money to buy sensors for every single state um, of my system and this bottom system is basically trying to be a a more realistic simulation of what you might encounter in real life where you're not able to measure the entire full state so we're gonna have to kind of hobble along and limp by using only the measurements that we actually uh, are able to directly uh, obtain here right okay so let's go ahead and save this and we'll come back to the MATLAB script and basically we we will run this again and maybe what we should do now is now let's look at maybe how does the other states do here so let's look at x1 tilde x2 tilde x3 tilde and va tilde and obviously maybe what i should do here is make sure that we are pulling off the appropriate signals here right so this is x tilde va tilde here right so now 
X1, X2, and X3, again, are the state trajectories under that, that crippled controller here. So let's go ahead and, and plot them all on top of the uh, full states here, right? So T, X1, tilde here. And then let's do the same thing for X2. And finally for X3. And then finally here for uh, the this as well here, right? For the control signal here. So VA tilde. Okay, great. So now what we should do is we're, we'll plot both of them on top of each other. So let's run this simulation here and see what we end up with here. So first, let's take a look at the states. And here we are. So you see here, now we're incurring some penalties and the system is not performing the way we expected, right? The blue line is what we had earlier and we were totally happy with that, right? It settled in one second. It did not seem to saturate the, the, the uh, control signal. Maybe we can, we can, let me pull the control signal over here and maybe we can stare at both of them simultaneously. Yeah, maybe let's see if we can put one on this side and then one on the other side, right? So here we go. Um, and now... Blue is what we wanted here, but since we can't measure the full state of the system, red is what we actually have. And you can see now, this is the problem here, right? When you're not able to measure the full state of the system, you just can't make a full state feedback controller. So uh, we end up with a scenario where the performance is severely degraded, right? We now have these oscillations um, and as it's trying to settle here. So this is... Um, uh, again, not ideal here, but this is one of the practical problems that you have to deal with when you're trying to use a full state feedback controller on a real system where you might not be able to measure the full actual state of the, of the plant. Okay, so we saw that this control scheme here didn't really work here, right? So we saw that this uh, had uh, significant uh, degradations. Right, there were these oscillations. It didn't really behave the way we expected. We were basically, we got some surprises when we tried to do this. And the surprises stem from the fact that um, really your full state feedback controller, right, we saw had, had non-trivial elements here for K2 and K3 here, right? These are not 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 trivial when compared to the to the k1 here right so this concept leads to a to a little bit of intuition of of maybe another way that we could try to uh tackle this problem here of not being able to measure the full state so the idea with this now is that you know what it would be really great if we were to somehow be able to design our full state feedback controller here such that uh, K2 and K3 were small, right? If we were somehow able to basically pick locations of poles, send that to the place command, cross our fingers and hope, hope, hope that K2 and K3 were, were small, then in that case, this scheme where we just neglect K2 and K3 would be totally fine. We wouldn't be surprised at all here, right? So the game plan at this point here is to choose desired closed loop pole locations such that the place command, right, or our pole placement procedure returns small K2 and K3, okay? All right, so how are we gonna do that? Which poles should we move here to hopefully allow K2 and K3 to be small here? So this is where actually a little bit of physical intuition about the plant is gonna help us here, right? Let's come back to this picture that we had, right? There were three blue X's, right? These were, are the, were the open loop poles here, right? We can think, what are all of these poles and what are they associated here with? So if you think about this, there's, there's a pole at the origin right here, right? So this lambda one of zero, this is basically a pole at the origin, right? This is something like a one over S in the Laplace domain, right? This is basically an integrator, right? Right? Where in this system here is there something to do with a, a pure integral here? Well, if you look at our state vector here, right, you can see that what? 
theta is basically the integral of omega here, right? So you can roughly say, and, and I'm going to have to put a bunch of asterisks here in a second because there's a couple of caveats, but this is approximately related to state theta or x1 here, right? Okay, and then we also know, let's let's think about this other one here, this, 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 this lambda 3 here, right, which was at minus 1015.9 here, right? Physically, what does that mean here, right? If you have a pole that's way out here in the left half plane, this is something that decays or responds extremely fast compared to at least these other two blue poles here, right? So this motor here, we got to think to ourselves, what does that mean? Like, is there, is there any dynamics here that are very, very fast compared to the rest of the system here, right? And we can say, yeah, actually, right, the electrical dynamics of this motor are much faster than the, the mechanical dynamics of the motor of like things like things rotating here. So we can basically say, again, this is all very shooting from the hip and, and with a big asterisk here, is that this is approximately, this pole is most likely heavily associated with state of the current here, right? Or X3, right? Because this current, this is the electrical component. Things with the current die quickly. They change very fast and they reach steady state very, very quickly compared to these other two here, right? And then lastly here, lambda two here, right? Which was uh, here at minus 4.77 here, right? We can kind of, again, roughly say that this has something to do with omega here or X2, right? So maybe let's, let's label these quickly and 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 maybe again i want to put giant asterisks around a lot of this discussion here because um you can't really do this in general but i think for this particular case it works well here um this state we said is mostly associated with theta here right right and again let's put a big asterisk in here um, I'll, I'll, I'll say what that asterisk is in just a second here this 4.7 here right this is associated with uh, omega and this one way out here is associated with uh, i right or, or i guess x3 maybe we should label these as, as x2 and x1 right and again let's put the big asterisks around all of these and the asterisks here the disclaimer here is that in general Right. It, it, it's difficult. You can't actually say that a pole or an eigenvalue is directly associated with a state. Usually it's it's associated with with multiple states here. Right. We have to do a little bit of eigenvalue eigenvector analysis if we really want to tease out how much does this eigenvalue influence each state here. Maybe we'll take a look at that in just a second here. But um, let's just put this here in, in as, a, as a disclaimer here that in general, um, it is difficult. It's not impossible here, but it's difficult to uh, associate an eigenvalue uh, slash pole with a particular state or states here, right? W um, without eigenvector analysis. Okay, maybe let's quickly talk about this eigenvector analysis here. Let me let me erase some of this here. Okay. <clears throat> so the eigenvector analysis that you would have to do, again, the derivation of this is probably outside the scope of this lecture here. Maybe if we have some time later, I'll, I'll take a dive into that here. But again, if you look at the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of A, so let's just go to MATLAB and ask it for eig here. And again, what this is going to return to you here is... Um, a bunch of uh, eigenvectors and a diagonal matrix of all the eigenvalues here. So what you're going to see here is that uh, the D matrix here is going to be just a square matrix with all the eigenvalues here. These three eigenvalues along the diagonals here, right? So it's just going to be 0 minus 4.7 minus 1015.9 here, right? And V here is going to be a, vec uh, a matrix of all of the eigenvectors for each of these. So the first eigenvector here you're going to get is a 1, 0, 0. Then you're going to get a minus 0 0.2, 0 0.97, minus 0 0.06. And then finally this one over here, this is going to be 0 0.0001, 0 0.0706. 0 0.9975 here, right? Okay, 
Um, and I guess maybe we should fill this out. Right? These are all going to be zeros over here, right? So what we see here is here's lambda 1, here's lambda 2, here's lambda 3 here. And then this row here is actually the eigenvector associated with eigenvalue number 1. This row here is going to be the eigenvector associated with eigenvalue number 2. And this, oh, sorry, column, I keep saying row. These are all columns I'm drawing here, right? This column here is the eigenvector associated with eigenvalue uh, lambda 3 here, right? So if you look at this here, right, this eigenvalue here of 0, right, you can actually see here that if I line this up with the states here, right, x1, x2, and x3, which are theta, omega, and i here, right, you can basically see that lambda 1 is actually completely and 100% and not not in any coupled way here it's completely associated with the first state here of theta here right x uh, lambda 2 here right this this pole right here which we claim is mostly associated with omega you can see that this eigenvector actually backs up that analysis here, right? Because there's this large component, 0.97. This is much bigger than these other two. I mean, I guess it's a this is non-trivial here. So it's a little bit coupled with the dynamics or the state here, x1 here. So this is where you see this, there, there's some of this cross-coupling. There's some of this um, connection. So we can't actually isolate an eigenvalue to a specific state because there are usually these scenarios here where you've got some of this crosstalk here. So, but... Still, I think it's fair to say that 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 eigenvalue lambda two here is mostly associated with state x two, which is the the velocity here. And finally, this last eigenvalue here of minus a thousand fifteen point nine, we can see from its eigenvector that actually, actually, yeah, this is a pretty good solid claim here that that eigenvalue is associated pure, almost purely with this last state x three here because the third component of its eigenvector is 0.9975 here, right? And these other two are basically negligible here, right? So what we can say is, you know, these, 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 these claims are roughly true here, right? So the game plan now here is maybe what we should do when picking these, these uh, desired closed loop locations, let, let's pull these off here, okay? For just a second. What we should do here is don't screw around with the ones that you're not able to actually directly measure here. So in other words here, this, eigen, uh, this eigenvalue, since we're not able to measure the current here, don't try to change the dynamics associated with the current or this state. So in other words, leave this exactly where it's, where it's sitting here right now. Same thing for omega here. We are not able to directly measure the um, velocity here, so don't mess with it here. So just leave its op its desired closed loop eigenvalue should be the same as the open loop eigenvalue here. However, we are able to, to measure theta directly here, so it shouldn't be a problem to move this. So what we should do is let's just again move it very slightly here. So let's move it over here to maybe like minus two. So maybe in, in blue, let's do our last pair here. So let's go here at minus two here for this closed loop one. This one here, just leave it at minus 4.77. And this one over here, leave this at minus 1015.9, right? And then let's go ahead and, and run place on that here. So in other words, let's fill out this table here with one last row here, right? So my P desired here is we're gonna move this one minus two here. And then these other two, don't mess with them. Leave them the same here. So maybe let's just say, uh, uh, well, what should I do here? Yeah, 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 uh, don't change right from the open loop position right and also here don't change okay so let's go do that and run over to matlab if we don't change these other two and only change the state that we're able to directly or sorry only change the eigenvalue that is mostly associated with the state that we can directly measure let's do that and see what the pole placement command is going to give us in terms of k and we'll look at the resulting uh performance here in simulink all right, so here we are. So all we got to do here is basically uh, come up with a new set of uh, desired closed loop poles like we talked about. How about minus two here? And then don't change the other two eigenvalues. 
something like that. And maybe let's just double check and make sure that this is in the correct order. I think it does list them in. Yep, here we go. So don't uh, leave this other one here at minus 4.8. Leave the other one at minus 1,015 uh, here. And we should be good to go. Let's, let's maybe comment out this one here. Um, and maybe let's make a small comment here that this is only move polls um, associated with states we directly measure here, right? So great, let's go ahead and maybe put a breakpoint here and run to that location. And if we do and look at the K matrix, this actually is, here we go. This isn't bad here, right? Look at the controller we end up with here. We end up with a 0.21 here for the first value, but the second K2 and K3, their magnitudes are, you know, relatively small when compared to the other one. So hopefully it's not a big problem to neglect them when uh, we run our simulation. So again, um, what we'll do here is run this model here so just to refresh your memory i'll open the model here this is actually the exact same situation we had earlier the top is the full on system if you actually were able to have all full state feedback control and then this bottom one is the realistic scenario where we're only using the the uh position of the motor for feedback here right so let's go ahead and run this whole thing and i'll pull up the the, the result and the control signal here so again let's put them side by side here and here we go this isn't bad here right so again there there obviously is still a difference between the blue and the red line but they're not as drastically different as we saw earlier right so we're not as surprised um, when we design and hope for the blue line but we actually get the red line here right so great, this looks uh, looks pretty good here and it looks like a reasonable way to go about trying to solve this implementation issue where in reality it's, it's difficult to measure the full state of the entire system. All right, great. So that was uh, pretty reasonable. So why don't we finish our table here just to make this uh, this summary slide complete here. So um, in this situation, we ended up with a controller here of K of 0.21-ish uh, here and then 0.04 and then about a 0 0.003 here, right? And again, what what actually resulted here was uh, this was a it was a reasonable controller, right? Right. It wasn't super aggressive here, um, and it didn't require us to use. Um, states which we we're not able to directly measure here. So I think this is probably the best we uh, we can get. It's the most realistic. It deals with control saturation issues. It deals with this inability to measure the full state of the system. And um, I think it's uh, it's a reasonable way to go about trying to implement a full state feedback controller with an actual real system here. So um, with that being said here, um, Let's talk real quickly about this concept here of, of choosing the eigenvalues and then kind of in a circuitous fashion, hoping that it resulted in a full state feedback controller that was actually implementable. Uh, when you hopefully when you're watching this something probably went twang in your and clang in your head and you said it was a little bit unsatisfactory here right it seemed like a very roundabout way indirect way of trying to design a controller here by moving these poles where we don't actually have a mapping to the actual state representations in a direct fashion here right so that is actually a perfect way to set the stage for our next topic here, which is linear quadratic regulators here, or LQR control. With LQR control, we're gonna see that it gives us a direct knob or a direct control where you can physically tune which states and which controls you actually care about when trying to design a full state feedback controller here. So hopefully um, we'll see you at the next video where we discuss some of that in this context here. So. With that being said, uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. If so, please subscribe to the channel because we'll have multiple other videos on control theory and other engineering topics in the future. Um, and with that being said, I hope to catch you at a future video. Bye.